Welcome to A Canadian Investing in the U.S., a podcast and YouTube channel focused on Canadians buying real estate with host Glenn Sutherland. Welcome to a new episode of A Canadian Investing in the U.S. Uh, with Glenn Sutherland. This week, my guest is Kelsey Ross, which after this episode, you might be rivaling a couple people for most... Uh, been on uh, been a guest the most amount of times on this show <laughs> so anyway thanks for coming again um for people who like i know you're gonna love this episode even though i have no idea what we're gonna talk about but um episode 83 uh episode 213 is another some other episodes with kelsey um his brother carl was on uh 175 so if you you like what we're talking about go find the other ones as well um you might have to go back a little bit i think 83 was done four years ago so wow <laughs> it's been a few years we've been doing this um but anyway uh kelsey let's just start off by uh i guess giving everyone a bit of an intro to yourself and then we'll we'll get into this Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, again, my name is Kelsey Ross. Uh, I've been a real estate investor since 2005. I'll do a quick summary. Uh, yes. I started out in uh, Waterloo. I'm from, uh, you know, Toronto area. I, the first investment property was in Waterloo, uh, student rental. Then from there, did student rental by York University. Did two over there, then did another one over by University uh, UOIT in Oshawa. So I was always in this like student rental market, not even regular rental, just student rental market. Did that for some time, tried a coin laundry, failed miserably, decided to stay with the real estate. And uh, then I really wanted to expand because, uh, you know, money was getting tight here as to, you know, continue to get mortgages and so forth. So, you know, looking into U.S. was something that I got intro introduced to. And really in 2006, when the dollar was near par, but I just didn't really take the risk at that point in time because I had a friend who moved down to Atlanta, but just wasn't ready mentally to, to take it on at that point. Um, so in 2018, got exposed to some opportunities in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Then it opened me to the doors to some tax uh, sale opportunities in Indiana. So that's kind of where the U.S. investing part has come in with me uh, since 2018. So I'm still, I would say at this point, I would say I was still a veteran rookie. Like, you know, I feel like still like a rookie at, at a lot of things I do, even though, you know, it's been a couple of years, right? Yeah, no, I get it. I had some similar story too. I was doing uh, investing in KW and Cambridge and, uh, you know, uh, eventually I outgrew the banks. They weren't going to lend to me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which was part of the part of the reason to go to the U.S., but not the whole thing. Um, there's there's a lot of reasons to do this. So, yeah. um, what have you been working on lately? We, we've been about a year since we chatted. Yeah. So, what I've been working on lately was uh, recently completed a duplex that I bought at the tax sale in twenty time plus. I think twenty twenty. I bought yep. that tax sale in twenty twenty, but you get the deed by about early twenty twenty one. So we started working on that. No, I got it on 2021 and I got the D 2022. Okay. So we started working on that last year. So we just completed it, tried to sell it actually uh, vacant. It's a duplex, two unit on top of each other. Didn't really get any bites because, again, it was around this, uh, late November, December, you know, not it's hard to time. sell stuff then like it's I, I find that like americans they don't want to move like even for to move into a property they don't want to buy stuff between their thanksgiving and new year's it's, just, right. it's tough <laughs> that's a tough spot to sell <laughs> right so you know we tried that didn't really work out so what we did now is we actually uh had a property we, we did a professional property manager and uh, have both the units rented out now. And it's renting out for a good clip. I think, you know, more than we anticipated. That's good. So now we'll go back to relist that one for sale with it, you know, turnkey already, your cap rates, your this, your that, et cetera, to make it more, you know, um, to, you know, investors who don't want to get into the dirt and grime of things. They just want to turn around turnkey opportunities. So we're going to go that direction with that one. Um, working on two other... Other rehabs as well, uh, a single family and another duplex as well, working on those. And yeah, and then also still trying to keep active, you know, pinching my pennies, but keeping active with buying, always buying. Like I was able to, I'm just close to purchasing a property off of someone who bought off the tax sale, but they cannot manage it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to pretty much get it for, you know, pennies on the dollar, really literally pennies on the dollar. Um, so, you know, always trying to keep active 
even when money's tied up in several different things, right? So, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And um, for those other properties, were those tax auctions as well? Uh, the one, the duplex that we rented out that we're going to resell, that one was a tax sale. Um, the other one that we're rehabbing, actually, you know what, Glenn? They're all from tax sale. One I bought, <laughs> the other one, the single family, I bought off of my friend's friend. Again, same thing. She bought it at the tax sale, she couldn't manage it. And, you know, I, so I just bought it off her. You know, I gave her what she paid for it plus a little bit more. And, you know, so that one, you know, it's great. And the other one we bought off tax sale for about three, four years. We just couldn't get to it, couldn't get to it, couldn't get to it. And we finally able to get to it now, yep. And which is a good thing. Because in that neighborhood, uh, the new mayor has, has a thing where they're planning to demolish, I think, about 90 homes or 83 homes in this in this neighborhood of gary and yeah. they've already demolished about 25 because when i was there the other day i counted 11 in like four minutes that wow. they had demolished so they're giving people like 60 day notices and things of that nature so you really got to get on it now the investors who just sit on the properties don't do anything with them you know you could find yourself with you know a demolished property plus a bill for the demolish as well right so wow wow that would be wild and like for people who are listening, they're going, wow, you're just like sitting on properties. Maybe like people, um, it's a little different. Like when you're, when you buy stuff cheap, you can, uh, you know, you buy it cheap and then it works into your schedule whenever you work. Like, um, I know for people, like we listed the podcast episodes beforehand. So if you want to know more about taxis, we touched on that, all that before. Um, but like what kind of price points, even like a range are these sort of in? So people got a kind of an idea. Uh, like you're just buying off of the no, like the, just the ones you were purchasing. Like what kind of tax deed sort of sure. tax points are you, you you look at? Yeah, you know, I'm still man. I don't want to make it sound so biased because you're not people who listening may not run into the same situations. Okay, Everything's yeah, different. exactly. Yeah, but uh, like the one that I'm purchasing off an individual right now, I think he may have bought it for three thousand, but I'm actually getting it for a thousand. Yeah, um, and he has another one that he bought for five hundred. But I'll give him a thousand for that one. Do you know what I mean? Just to yep. kind of balance things yes. out or whatever. And then in turn with those, I might rehab those. Those may be ones I might just clear out because I actually had my arborist guy go there, walk it, give me a price to cut, cut all the trees, clear all the garbage from the yard, and just turn and sell those. So yeah. I'm not sure. But it really, it really, it really depends, honestly. I, I'm still finding stuff sub five thousand. I've sold stuff sub 10,000. I had another property. I just, I, I didn't want to get to that one because across the street, I know the guy who lives there and the, how they live and across over there, there was a burnt house. So rehabbing houses on certain blocks, it may not always be the best or beneficial because, you know, you may make the house pretty, but the end buyer, they have to look outside at something every day. So that's one thing that I should say that I'll kind of tie that I've learned is yeah. that not every deal is a deal at the end of it. Yep, that's a good note. Um, right? And like, so for these properties, so say you, had, you, you, know, you buy it cheap and you're like, it's not a big issue, right? Because it's, you know, if you're just, you know, a project that's, you know, a thousand, even $5,000 you put into purchase, it's not a big deal to let it sit until you're ready to go. Um, is there much for carrying costs on these? Are you having to pay taxes and any utilities? I'm assuming they're all cut. What, what kind of expenses do you have while you're waiting for this to go? Sure. It kind of goes at different various stages because um, like the taxes are ultra cheap, especially ones you've got off a tax sale or been sitting vacant, you know, ultra cheap. Some have been as low as like $75 every six months, uh, you know, under, you know, all of them are under $500 a year for taxes yeah. that, I, that I have at this point. They're all under 500 you know, carrying costs, you may have electric on where you're starting the rehab. So usually you get the electric on early so you can, go and work or we can have guys go and work there and so forth. So, you know, minimal carrying costs, I should say yes. the way we do it at this point in time with those type of purchases. And like you were saying, that's why we could kind of hold on to them and not have to rush into it as to if I have a hard money loan or a, a mortgage where like, you know, every month you're looking at that interest and that payment that you pay, you you really feel like you have to get to it. You have to go. Yeah. With these during your pocket, like, you know what, let me make the economic decision here. Let me use the economic person that makes sense here. I don't have to rush, rush with everything, right? 
At what point do you put the uh, insurance on the property? Hello, everybody. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that I've created a new coaching program. I believe the new coaching program has way more value than any of the programs that have even existed in the past. What we've done is pre-recorded all the lessons so that you can work through it at your own pace, which is pretty cool. And then we're going to meet up on a regular basis to answer the questions, do deal analysis, and actually spend our time together working on things instead of spending our time learning things. I think this will make a seamless transition to buying in the United States and will help you solve a lot of your problems. If this is of interest to you, go to glensutherland.com slash coaching. I hope to help you guys invest in the United States and I hope we provide as much value as possible. Back to the podcast. Oh, so depends on which property how that property is valued. But usually by the time we get electric and water on, then we're buying the insurance for the property as well. Yeah, just so then you have that stuff covered. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so you're not- you're The not risk though, I, I want to say, Glenn, it depends on how much you pay for something and your risk threshold. Because really and truly, I should say, by the time you get the property, you should be buying insurance. That's the right advice. But I'm right. just being honest because a lot of real estate investors, hey, kind of each situation may go on a different path. But to say it by the book, you should get insurance as soon as you get the property, right? But yes, yeah, you know what? That actually brought up a good story for me. Even my property manager, because um, I do like a weekly meeting with them, like you should be. But um, about I think it was in the fall this year, I was having a call with them, and they're like, um, "Just so you, you know, just so you know, we had a property that closed, and the previous owner burnt it down the day afterwards, and they hadn't put their insurance on yet." But we're talking like a hundred thousand dollar house in cash. Oh, that's different. Yeah, <laughs> that's totally. <laughs> like you should be put line, lining this up with your closing, right? <laughs> um, but so they're in. Uh, but honestly, when there's arson, then there, it's a totally different ballpark. Um, right. It might take you some time to get that money back. Um, yes. But it, and who knows if the seller even has the the funds to do it. I guess you gave them a hundred grand. So I guess they do. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, um, it, it might be a, a bit of a pain, but do put in, like I said, do put in, but it's, it's all about threshold. Like you said, so if you bought a $5,000 house and if it burnt down, would you be okay with that? Like, would that, uh, you know, would that ruin you or would it not ruin you? And everyone's going to be in a different point of view. And they might even go a $30,000 house. Would that ruin me or not ruin me? Uh, and then especially since some of the insurance carriers are going to say the minimum per square foot is this, right. so we're going to charge you like, uh, you know, I don't know, a thousand, two thousand dollars a year, depending on where it is and what it is and size of it and everything else. Um, right. So it, it you have to make it make sense. If you're just going to let it sit there and it's five hundred or five thousand dollars, you know, it may not make sense. Right. Correct. Because, you know, we you're going to start getting to rehab and depending on the type of insurance and so forth that you have, some have like six months insurance that they'll give you and so forth. So m maybe you don't want to necessarily, again, you should get insurance as soon as you buy a, pro a property. But if you're in a situation where it's like, like I said, I bought a house for a thousand or two thousand yeah. dollars, I value all dollars. But if I really, something really happens badly to that, the, ho the house usually needs a full rehab anyways, right? I yep. mean, we don't want to burn it down, but again. Yeah, I, the, I, the other I, side I, of the coin too, I, like, uh, I don't know if I, I often put it on the, I don't think on the podcast, but I had a property about a year and a half ago in uh, Dayton, Ohio, and the uh, it burned down and they gave you insurance. But it's, uh, you know, if you insured that thing for $150,000, even if you haven't started the reno yet, they pay out insurance based on what you've bought insurance for. So it, uh, yeah. for me, I always call it the easiest flip I've ever done in my life. Right. Um, wow. But, but, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so there, there's both sides of this coin. Um, so I, anyway, you're you're just like me. Um, we're we're both buying. Uh, we're both selling. We're both uh, you know renovating during this uh, interesting market cycle we're in now. Have you found that you've changed anything the way you're doing anything? Uh, is there more like is there any risks that are concerning with you during this period? And you know how you, how do you mitigate this? How what do you what are you doing differently over this last year? Sure. So I. Really just back, I wanted to move away from the full gut rehab stuff. I really wanted to move into, you know, different higher price points and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the little bit of time at this point, I've I've just reverted back to like, I'm just running into some of these deals where it's, it's just too hard to ignore. <laughs> so, you know, I'm trying not to hunt for full rehabs because like I really want to pick up speed stuff right and with full rehabs really sitting vacant homes you have to almost touch everything 
But I will say turnkey, I never use the term thinking about it. I've always really bought and sold turnkey properties, but more and more the lingo of the turnkey, I think that's more in the, the forefront. The previous home I sold as well, I had it using as kind of like a Airbnb when yeah. people would come into town. When I would come into town, I would stay there. When my friends would come to town to look on their properties, they would stay there. Yeah. Um, was going to sell it vacant. It didn't sell. I got a tenant in it. I got a really good, my, my property manager got a really great rental. I think thirteen fifty for the property was renting for a single family home, three bedroom, one bathroom. I thought I was going to get maybe like $900. So, you know, I sold it for only $85,000. So the, the buyer, you know, they, they, they stuck with the deal, even though I had to get clear title again and yep. issue with the title. But they still really want it because again, they're buying for 85, they're getting a turnkey 1350 rent right away. That those are good numbers. I'm not sure good the numbers. percentage, yep. but just by head, you know those are good numbers. So I've turned to more the model of turnkey. So, like again, the other duplex we're talking about is going to be the same way, now listed as a turnkey. Yep. So we're hunting those investors who are just looking for something that they could just get and go right away instead of the ones that are where it's vacant. And it's not an end user like, you know, retail is fine to, to sell, you know, vacant. But now one's more investor type neighborhoods or investor type properties. It's I feel like this is a better direction to go. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, when people are buying uh, properties, like I'm assuming this is a Canadian that bought it. Or maybe it's American. Uh, American. If, American. OK. But if a Canadian was to buy this, like I know that uh, lending maybe a year or two years ago, they basically would lend on even a $50,000 property. I'm finding right. that it's like getting higher the thresholds of what they'll lend on. Uh, is that going to be a concern with uh, selling properties under a hundred K? No, because most of mine are not under a hundred. There was just that one. Oh, just I was that one. Kinda, okay. <laughs> yeah. And I was just kind of pressed really. If, if I had waited till now to sell, I could probably sell, but you know how this investor thing goes. Oh, sometimes. Yeah. Time's money. money. Like, hey, liquidate. Right. So, yeah. Uh, majority of the stuff have been in the in the range of say one thirty to one sixty. Oh, they're kind golden of, and for financing then, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And my friends just sold one. Year, well, was supposed to be closing April first. They sold for one seventy. They set like a new record on that block for price wise, like nice. valuation wise, uh, on the block as well. And e hopefully, once we sell this one that we have as well, we'll set a new record for this this block that we have and we've also i'm straight sideways but it everything's attached because we're all investment yeah. conversation what we've done with when what we do with a lot of these homes that are vacant we help build back the block for real because we we help see the vision for investors who are thinking about it so five multiplexes have been sold since we started and finished the rehab on on the brick duplex that we have right now so that's five that have been bought and there's three that's currently being rehabbed as we speak. And I know two were sold at, uh, in the auction of last year. So they'll get their deed probably anytime now. So maybe they'll start rehabbing. But again, we spurred that momentum on the block, right? Which, which is going to do good for us, do good for the neighborhood and do good for other investors as well. So, and do good for the city. Because oh, yeah. now they'll be getting taxes from block where there wasn't barely any tax influx from right so yeah no i've done both where i've started the that sort of thing and then i see the dumpsters show up afterwards and i've also seen like hey i'm like contractor you want to walk this property for me and then they they go over and they're like hey uh just so you know there's uh there's dumpsters in front of two houses and i'm like that's a good sign like maybe right. I comp against them <laughs> <laughs> right. and i'm like okay well, do you have the addresses and i go look <laughs> these up what they bought these things for what are they doing because <laughs> you know it, with all of this even still you don't have to reinvent the wheel there's other people doing the same things as us right um out, out there right um you I touch, touch on one thing quick, yeah right? yeah, yeah, you yeah. Mention of, like how what i've done different and what we're doing different is another thing of like you know that talk of driving for dollars we're taking that really way more seriously now. You know, we're driving to check this property. You know, oh, take down this address. Oh, prop stream. Oh, reverse uh, search address. Oh, send them a letter. Like, this is real. It used to be theory to me, but when you're in it and you actually have contacts with so many people in and around you and have the time to connect these people, there's a lot of people that just don't want it, can't manage it, or it's just a bother, right? So, 
Yeah. That's another thing that we've been doing. And I've done this before too, is like, it's kind of expensive now. Uh, I used to get maps of like, you know, paper maps of like cities. And then if you're like, um, like when I'm doing Canadian investing, I'm like, Hey, if I could do a duplex conversion, I'm like, and I start marking the roads with that had the ones that were duplexable, right? They had the right sort of look. And, you know, in the States, you could start marking the ones that are your stuff, right? So you're you're a little bit more focused because there is deals on the MLS, right? But if you look at a city, it's just overwhelming and you just start <laughs> marking it up. You st- <laughs> but th- those maps are getting like, I, I remember being down in, uh, I was in Michigan uh, in just before Christmas and I was down uh, in Ohio and went to Kentucky and I was just like, I just went to the gas station like, can I get a map? And they're like, no. <laughs> they're like, use your phone. They literally said, use, just use your phone. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not what I want. I'm like, I want a map. But I'm like, if you try and buy them from Canada, you got to pay for international shipping. And they want like 40 bucks for a map. You're like, this is getting stupid for like a $4 map. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, it, it's uh, with a lot of this stuff. You just figure out where it is, what your your pl- spots are. Um, there's certain roads. Um, there was one road in. in well, anyway, I, I just be you just start working on house, and then your next house comps against it. I had two fourplexes right next door to each other, and so you get the one, and you get the good appraisal on that one. You're like, hey, it's time to time to refi or get the something going on the other one because we now have a good comp right next door, even yeah. though it's one I own as well. But it's just like, and then you'll see, um, because I. Even my property manager will tell me, hey, one of the other investors here, you should have this conversation with your property manager. They're like, hey, somebody else who I managed for has another fourplex in that area and they just got a refi and they got this value. And I'm like, oh, time for me to go get a refi too. Like, right. need appraisal right now. I want to come up against that guy. And it's brand right. new. And it's going to show up as a, on the list. So, you know, that's one thing we, we haven't done yet. You know, we every time there's just something else, it is try uh, actual refinance. You know, mm-hmm. you've done one recently and how, how was that kind of going for you as well? We haven't done one since the, the fall, okay. um, early fall. Um, honestly, right now I'm in kind of a hold period. I just got my E2 visa in November. Congratulations. Um, and yeah, so um, some of the lenders will look at that like an American and, and use my iTunes credit score to qualify me. And some of them will say, and I tend credit score is for foreign national. And mm-hmm. so we used to get stuck back in the foreign national program. So what I really need to do is go down to the U S uh, go to a social security office, get a social security number. Now that I have a visa right. and then I can get American lending. So right now I'm kind of on hold for that. Um, for people who are wondering when we're recording this, it, we're recording this March 21st. So I believe this afternoon, the feds making an announcement. Um, so um, this probably won't come up for, I think, for two weeks. But um, so it'll still be pretty recent. But um, based on that conversation, it might be whether I'm going to do refis again, right? Right. So some of the banks right now are going like what they'd call in Canada, like prime minus. Like, so they're right. just to get loans because they're they need in the business of doing loans and no one's doing anything. Correct. Even including myself. I'm like, I'm not doing refis until I figure out what the Fed's going to do, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so Because I'm like, why would I pay this rate if I could wait a like three months and get this rate. I'm like, so um, I think, and the Fed in the, maybe I'm going on a rant, but back in November when they said that they were going to do three rate drops in 2024, it just was, I think it put the market on hold. Right. Uh, which it, it, it sucks, but like people are like, well, why would I buy now if it's going to be cheaper for my mortgage payment if I wait six months, right? right? So they're just like, it just, it just slowed the market even worse which wasn't a great idea. But if you're like, say, uh, a lease option or a contract for deed sort of uh, seller, the, like that's what they want, right? Because they're like, hey, get the property, I'll get the house I want right now, and then I'll buy it based on today's prices. While well, they're, you know, could be deflated. As soon as the rates drop, the prices will go up. So they'll get a better appraisal. Like it, there's a lot of options. For, anyway, we're, I'm going on a side yeah, rant. No, but, but I think that it, you made a point there because everything kind of connects with when it comes to like uh, the market and what. Most of the the people we are selling to are new home buyers, first time buyers, and so forth. So where this talking about the the market and rates and how uh, this affects ones who are maybe flipping or even to hold or what you're looking to do, but say flipping for example, you have to try and make sure that these properties are pretty much have all the bells and whistles. You know your AC unit, your little pretty black splash, or pretty painting, or 
some accent wall or some nice lights or I think you really have to from I'm seeing what's sitting on the market and based on what we kind of been through as well is that the small things the 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 end points for the new home buyers are very important to make sure things actually turn over in this market in my eyes in the market that we have yeah, and I, I deal with a lot of uh, the same sort of price points for sales with the, the 150 to 200 sort of mark. Um, and when you're in those neighborhoods, like we both are, um, my new policy is to put a cage on the air conditioner. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I just had another one stolen just last week. And I'm just like, all right, enough of it's enough. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, it was, the house was for sale, listed on the market. And the realtor's like, uh, there's no air conditioner anymore. <laughs> right. Oh. Hey, listen, because i'm pretty how do i say this uh, <laughs> socially correct uh but i'm pretty uh, you know i'm pretty uh attached in neighborhood so when i hear the calls saying hey i have ac units i'm like well first of all no way but then i also know that hey you know it's an easy spree right so you'll hear the calls from people you know guys who work with you work with someone else saying Oh, they got AC units. Those are obviously the number one, one of the number one things stolen, right? So you either have to have them caged, a fence around them so people can't see them, so that you you can't see them because mm -hmm. sometimes you build little fences around them so you just well, you know out of sight, out of mind situation. But a minimum a cage, you know. Some we even had two where we had them caged, but they weren't even sealed in the ground. But just the mere fact that you know what I mean, they're in the yeah. ground and yeah. so forth. But um. Yeah. But it happens even I had uh, like a $400,000 property in the uh, down in Florida maybe 3 years ago and the AC got stolen on that too and it so it, it happens oh, yeah. at all different price points and all different places usually you're like oh, that's a nice neighborhood all those but it still uh, it still happens. And I want to say that quickly as well because yes I, a lot of the neighborhoods I work in have maybe you know you're not seeing the highest value whatnot but these things of all the different things happen in different magnitudes in every real estate environment. Your million dollar homes, you got million dollar thieves. You know, your middle age, middle uh, value homes, you got middle value thieves. They're stealing different things. They might be selling more equipment. They may be selling whole pallets of stuff that are uh, at your property. There's different things. There's the, you know, on the lower end, the quick smash and grab, steal your AC, break in, try and steal your water tank or something like that. So there's, there is thefts and these things at all different levels of this as well. Yep. Yes. Yeah, just protect yourself. And Correct. AC, AC cage is a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Especially in a vacant house. Um, if yes. you're, and even if it's for sale, um, that doesn't deter them because there's Do nobody there. Lights on at your vacant homes? Honestly, probably not. Um, oh, I always... I, uh, well, I, I'm not there. Right. So I'm, right. uh, it's kind of on the, the, the realtors or the, you know, project manager or whatever, but it's actually not holding a bad idea. Cost. That's the holding cost. Like that is something I do leave on, like leave on a light upstairs. If there's upstairs, downstairs, upstairs, downstairs, a front light, have a dust till dawn light. There's just some things that are, that are, you know, help a little bit deter or at, at minimum, you know, people can study you and know really, but an all darked out house. No. I wonder if there's like a service just to park a car in the, in the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> just like, so it looks like somebody's actually there, right? Cameras, uh, do you use cameras? So I, I used to use cameras and then they, uh, honestly, it turned into an expense because they just kept getting stolen. Um, so every time, uh, and it wasn't by like who you'd think. So right. we'd finish the project and have cameras or be working on, I have cameras and then we finish the project and then it, it sells or it refinances and the cameras would just go missing and you're like you don't know who because there's so many people with keys was it the project right. manager was it the property manager was it the contractor was it the realtor and you're just like you start sending emails and you just never track down these cameras it's just like okay it turned into like a line item like okay we're gonna buy another 250 dollars set of cameras for this project again right. and it just kept disappearing um so what we then switched to doing was renting the cameras okay and uh, like sometimes a, a property manager will rent the cameras. Right. Um, and you know what? 
they're going to make sure they get them collected, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So it's, and if they don't, if you like talk to a property manager or someone who or a project manager is managing it for you, you're like, Hey, you can make some extra money. You go buy these cameras for 300 bucks. I'll rent them off you monthly. You'll make money on these. And uh, yeah, it's, it could be a win-win for them. Right. I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're opening a, a discussion. Maybe, you know, in the future, if we ever discuss again, is property management. Because a lot of us believe that, you know, you just get a property manager and, and things are, are good to go. There's many levels, repairs, collecting the money, disbursing the money to you, the correct disbursements to you. So there's many of things. Are they vetting the people? You know, there's many of things when it comes to property oh, yeah. management, but I just want to say that quickly, but that can open a whole other conversation as you're probably aware as well. Oh, yeah. I just did a... Um maybe a month ago, I recorded a new video for um, my course. And it was like an hour and a half of just property management, just like that one, I like, think of them as a trade, but like that one trade, just like, there's a lot of stuff, even when you're interviewing them to understand what they're doing, because they're not created equally. Um, right. The statements are like the, the contracts are not the same. Uh, right. People include stuff, don't include stuff. Some people hire electricians, some people have them on staff. It can be vastly different. And your property may dif differentiate how and what type of property manager you're going to use because we have a property manager that kind of generally manages, but we kind of handle everything else. Yeah. And then we have one that's full service, does everything, all the line items, everything. So it really depends on your property, what you need as well. But, you know, it's good to have a good one because, you know, weird things happen, strange things happen. So you want to have someone who's... In, in all honesty, if you're starting out um, and you're planning on having a lot of properties... Um, I usually will say, start out with two property managers, one yeah. for your, a, a new one for your second one. Cause at that point it's not offensive to them, but if yeah. you go, cause everyone's like, I'll do that later. This happens to, this has happened to me. You go get like 20 properties in a market and you're like, okay, I'm going to add a new property manager to make this <laughs> up. And then they're really offended. What, what is happening? You're not going to work with us anymore. You're taking this away. You know, like right. it, it, they're like, you're like, it, it hurts your relationship a little bit, but if you did it right from the start, you're like, look, I'm just. I'm splitting it just because it's nothing wrong with you or them, but like stuff happens. Um, sometimes uh, I had a guest on a show and they're, they had a small little company and the property manager was like 60 and he died. Mm. And there was like the staff just weren't, there was only like two other staff and they weren't able to like just run a company after he's dead. Basically the company's done wow. and they're just like, no one's collecting rent. No one's doing this. He had wow. uh, like 30 properties that weren't getting rent collected. And it was oh. just like, I think he jumped on a plane and flew there. Cause he's just like, you know, it, you don't want to be in that situation. It'd be much nicer to say, I have all the contracts. You call up your other one. Here you go. You're the property manager for another whole pile of properties. And let's just continue. Right. Right. Anyway, no, there's, there's a little couple tips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, you know, probably, like I said, you know, it's, I don't want to stay long because we're just kind of bouncing through things. But, you know, I probably manage every property I had here in Ontario. So releasing and removing myself from being managing ultra hard initially, ultra mm -hmm. hard. Like I still, but I'm still with them. Like you still have to run stuff by us because I don't want you just to make some wild ass decision. You still have to contact us, especially yep. if it's out of control. Unfortunately, because of my spirit and my energy and who I am, I still make contacts. Like one of the buildings we have down in Indiana, some of the tenants know me, so they still have my number. And, you know, yes. so it's, you know, but it has saved us thousands of dollars because of specific issues. So I'm yep. not suggesting it to anyone, but sometimes it kind of goes like that in certain relationships. It's just like that. Yeah. And um, I know back, um, I don't know, five, 10 minutes ago, you were talking about uh, staying away from full rehabs. Like uh, just to bring our conversation back to what we're doing different in this market, right? Yes. Um, and it's one thing that I've honestly started doing too. Um, I don't, uh, but it's way more competitive buying less, uh, you know, closer to rent ready, like cosmetic rehabs. Everybody wants those. Right. Everybody wants those. You're going to be, it's a much more competitive market. So if you don't have an advantage with like the, the wholesaler or somebody, it's, it, it's, it's tough, but if they know you're a buyer, a lot of times they'll just take your offer, even if it's lower, but I don't want to compete. <laughs> um, and I was still, <laughs> I, I, I want, I don't want to do full rehabs cause the, um, they take longer, right. Yeah. And they take a lot longer 
And there's a lot of money in it. But the thing is, what if the market changes? There's a lot of what if the Fed doesn't do this? What if, you know, there's, um, you know, a year or two ago when everything was going up, you're like, hey, it goes long. We make extra money. And right. now you might still make the same. You might make a little bit extra. Some of my stuff in certain markets have actually went up through the renovation. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, for my underwriting, I'm banking on it going down. Right. <laughs> like right. I'm, going so I'm, a, I'm playing her safe, right? Uh, so anyway, it's something to think about. I'm, I've been buying just more cosmetic style instead yeah. of the full rehab. Something we can get in and out of in like a month, maybe two months, instead of some of the stuff where we might be in permits for two months. Mind right. you, I do am doing a project in Kansas City where we did go into permits for two months, but it's a it's a primo deal. Oh, <laughs> it, it had to make sense, right? Um, but I don't want to be in permits for two months, right? Well, that was long. Get... And the reason it was so long is because we had to do, uh, we we're redoing the whole house. Okay, um, so, so we had to get and so forth. structural permits, which are slower, uh, and then drawings that had to get approved because we're moving walls and stuff, and and it's attached to the structural. So that you, it slows it slows everything down. Right, right. It definitely can slow it down. I, you know, because it's recording, this is going on. I'm not going to tell you how long we <laughs> take to get permits, but you know. <laughs> Close your eyes and <laughs> open your eyes. <laughs> no, but uh, you know that that depending on your market, how that permit thing goes, that you know definitely affect you. And like I said, so far, like in the market with regards to rehab, like we've seen, I'm not gonna lie, it's been a even in the slow times, being a steady because the market was so d depressed dollar wise. Yep. It, 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 you know, even with the slow, it's still still going up, and there's still uh, so many people in that new home buying area that, that, you know, that are still able to get, you know, mortgage, you know, maybe you're even sometimes a closing, a kickback on the closing to make things happen as well, as long as you're pricing accordingly. But right now at this point in time, I think it's the pro product. When I'm seeing in the market that we're in, the product has to be on point as possible. If you're looking to market it to investors, you're probably best to have a turnkey with good numbers. If you're doing to end to, uh, a retail flip, you better have like it really ready to go. You know, a fridge, a stove in there as well, or a microwave event. Like I see a lot of houses sold with no uh, kitchen fixtures, no appliances, sometimes no gutters on them and so forth. So m in my eyes, have it finished as, as, as to the T as possible. So it's really turnkey for the retail buyer as well. And I think, you know, what I'm seeing sold, what we've sold recently, I see that being the biggest thing. Where I, one that, that dragged out and took long to sell, I didn't have the nicest finishes. You know, yeah. it, it wasn't, it was just kind of blah, right? So it ended up being in, had me having to put a tenant into it and sell to an investor rather than an end buyer with a retail sale, right? So, yep. that's yeah. Cool. Yeah, speed is is important right now. And that's, and turnkey is more appealing because depending how you look at this, you, you know, we could be at, I maybe I'm not going to say predictions or anything, but we could be at the bottom, right? Um, right. You know, and it, it, you, you know, some of these can make more sense now, but a lot of it is you just don't want to be tied up in these. Uh, I'm tired the same way of getting tied up in rehabs that go way too long. Yeah. Um, it because it hurts. It honestly hurts you mentally just because it takes so long. And you're dealing with these people like contractors on the same project for too long, um, and it if you have like raised money. Um, it could hurt you in payments if you have joint ventures. It it just it it's just going too long. It hurts their returns, right? right. Um, and so it, it times money right now, right? I'd much rather get into something that's a lot closer to rent ready or sell ready. Get the stuff in it, get it out, or even you know um, we bought in the summer. We bought I think a package of three properties that. Uh, we're basically rent ready, but we got them at a good price. So right. based on our analysis and then my realtor's analysis, um, we were buying them at like, you know, 65 cents on the dollar, but they were tenanted and paying and, you know, how they had rent rolls to show that they've been paying. So we're like, all right, well, we'll just refi as soon as the Fed rate drops. <laughs> right. Well, that's, that's, again, that's really, like I said, I start out saying that, yep. still get stuck back into full rehab, but really that. I know really to, to pick up speed with what we're doing at this point in time, it really has to be close to cosmetic ones. It's just, yeah. it's hard to turn a blind eye to the ones with the juice to squeeze, right? But yeah, again, it, it's, yeah. These, oh, yeah. After I purge these last ones out of my system, then, you know, we'll turn a different direction. So we'll see. Oh, 
Awesome. Uh, Kelsey, um, well, maybe we'll, we'll, I'll keep, I'll get you back again. If people wanted to uh, get a hold of you, maybe we're, I'm just wrapping this up, but if people wanted to get a hold of you, how do they, how do they track you down? Sure. Um, I do have on, oh, what's up? On Instagram, I'm most high RBG. Yep. On Facebook, I am K.E. Ross. On YouTube, I think I'm RBG Investments. I post some videos of some of the stuff that I do. Yeah. I, I like to watch the videos. I like to see what's what's going on, right? I'm going to get a 4K camera so, and a mic so like I can really be in, in the trenches and show people. Because that's why I like to show people a lot of the stuff that actually takes place. I go and I be with the contractors, go through the mud, go through exactly and see the, the grime of things as well. So you guys can find me there or maybe a link up give to, to Glenn or something. Sure. Uh, but no. Peace to all the Canadians and peace to you, Glenn. Thank you very much for what you have put out, what you provided for Canadians. Because trust me, you're such a great asset well, to all you. of us who are looking south of the border. Well, thanks to you too as well. Like I've seen you present and uh, you've been a guest multiple times. So you're giving back as well, right? I think that's what it's, it's all about because we don't need to have a whole bunch of us uh, reinvent the wheel and struggle. It's just let's like just build off each other and do this a lot quicker and easier. That was a nice video. Bye.